Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is December 6, 2018, and my guest is economist and author Mariano Mazzucato. She holds the chair in the Economics of Innovation and Public Value at University College London and is founder and director of the University College London Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Her latest book is The Value of Everything, Making and Taking in the Global Economy, which is the subject of today's conversation. Mariana, welcome to EconTalk. Thank you so much. Very happy to be here. Underlying your book is the idea that the economics profession has misunderstood the nature of what is valuable and how to think about it, and that in turn has hampered good public policy. Summarize your argument. So one of the key points in the book is actually that we've stopped debating value. So ironically, the concept has left economics departments and gone to business schools where the word is all over the place in terms of shareholder value, value chains, or shared value, a more trendy way to talk about it. But economists used to basically for 400 years actually debate what are the productive parts of the economy and what are the perhaps unproductive parts that if they grow too large will siphon out resources. So the physiocrats back in the 1700s were very concerned about how the landlords of the time seemed to be siphoning out too much value compared to the value that was actually being created by the value creators in their minds who were the farm laborers. Similarly, the classical economists, people like Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and Karl Marx, they focused on the value creation that occurred basically by industrial labor and inside factories. And so someone like Adam Smith was very interested in the division of labor within these factories, how thinking about that division would increase productivity, growth, and hence the wealth of nations. And Karl Marx complemented that also with his big focus on the role of technological change in the effect that would actually have on the amount of labor required, which he thought was one of the key sources of uh, surplus value and profits in the system through the exploitation of labor. So he questioned whether capitalism itself would be able to reproduce itself given what was happening on the labor side. But just to say the big revolution that happened, which I pinpoint in the book, was that this concern with the objective conditions of production. In other words, what was actually happening in the agricultural land, what was happening in the factories with the machinery, with the division of labor and technological change, that then changed with modern neoclassical thinking and the attention went to a subjective understanding of value, where value is actually basically in the eye of the beholder. So supply and demand curves, preferences, all this focus on the individual firm, the individual consumer, the individual worker. So even wages are looked at in terms of preferences that workers have for leisure versus work. And what I do in the book is I don't say, oh, look at today's value theory, it's totally wrong. What I actually argue is that the debate around value has disappeared. Value itself is no longer contested. What we end up having having is a, kind of a, a fuzzy, uh, a flimsy notion of value, which makes it much easier for value extraction activities to actually pass for value creation ones. That's what's new. It's not that value extraction itself is new. That was already, as the physiocrats highlighted, happening in the 1700s, but the landlord's of the time didn't pretend to be value creators. They didn't pretend to be innovators or fundamentally creative parts of society. They just said, give me your money. That's why, by the way, Adam Smith called uh, rent robbery and landlords thieves. (laughs) They were seen as basically earning income by doing nothing. So rent itself as a category, rent as as an economic category, was seen as unearned income. Whereas today, that concept is seen just as an imperfection towards a competitive price. But so this big revolution of making value go from an objective to a subjective category, but in the process, economic students no longer being taught that there's actually different notions of value and that this fundamentally affects how we measure GDP, for example, or how we think about governance of particular types of organizations in business or elsewhere, then 
you know, makes it very difficult to steer economies in ways that actually produces, uh, you know, innovation led growth, sustainable growth, inclusive growth, which everyone seems to want. So where we agree on here is, I think, uh, let me let me restate the part of your uh, let me try to restate your argument in different in a slightly different way. Uh, I think a lot of capitalists, which are free market people like myself, would argue that profits are earned. You have to get a profit, you have to make something of value that people like, and if they're willing to pay for it, obviously they they like it. That's the subjective part, and I think we agree on that. Where we also agree is that there are some profits that don't appear to be producing uh, real value, and that would be, mm-hmm. say, the financial sector where their profitability and an incredible growth in their profitability does not seem to be uh, correlated with producing value – and I have I have smart friends who will – when I point out that, that this is a problem, smart friends who happen to agree with me ideologically, they say, but don't we need a big financial sector to, to enhance growth and, and, to, and to fund good activities, et cetera? And my answer to that is no, and I suspect that's your answer also. Well, see, so it depends. It's quite curious because Adam Smith, um, you know – again, who is one of the three main classical economists, first of all, he would differ from you in how you talk about the free market. For Adam Smith, it wasn't free from the state. It was free from rent, free from rent seeking. And in order to limit rent seeking in the economy, which he understood to be unearned income, so people kind of just moving things around and yet getting funds for that, um, you actually needed also a more smart state. But the other thing is that well, I unlike – I don't disagree sorry? with any – I don't disagree with any of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I agree I guess with what I meant, all that. <laughs> yeah, I guess I would mean more how the common uh, economist also, uh, also sometimes uses the word free market. I don't think most people realize that Adam Smith meant free from rent, not free from the state. But sort of a, another point in terms of Smith and, and how he comes into this discussion is he actually – made a list, it was quite a funny list actually, of those activities he thought were productive and those he thought were unproductive. The unproductive list is quite funny because he seemed to not like the opera very much. So he would put opera dancers, opera singers, and all sorts of musicians, which didn't mean that he thought they weren't actually important. He just thought they weren't actually creating value. What what I think Marx did, which Adam Smith didn't do, is he didn't make this static list like, you know, this is where production happens, this is where value is created, and this is where it sort of doesn't happen. He actually looked at what was happening. So if you were driving a truck uh, with certain types of merchandise in a particular direction, you might actually be creating value if you were just kind of driving around luxuriously. You weren't. Um, In other words, the financial sector itself, it's not about finance being good or bad or being value creating, value extracting. Is well, what is finance actually doing? And so, and don't forget that Marx's objective was actually quite different. He was very interested in how, again, surplus value and exploitation occurs in the economy. But still, he had a more dynamic understanding of this kind of these categories. And I think the question of finance today, it's the real question is how can we reform finance, for example, for it to have a more direct relationship with productive capacity in the real economy, for example, in an in industry? And how would we have to then change the ways that it is relating to the real economy, but also literally maybe think up new types of financial institutions. Uh, an example would be, you know, innovation, which is very key to economic growth, doesn't require any type of finance. It requires patient, long-term strategic finance of the kind that some public banks are providing around the world. You know, Huawei, number one telecoms company in the world today, would not have existed without the patient finance it received from the China Development Bank. Similarly, the the internet would have never happened without the patient finance received uh, from a DARPA-type institution in the U.S. And so this kind of need for more patient, strategic, long-term committed finance would be one way to turn finance to be more valuable um, in terms of actually being better able to drive the long-term capacity building in the economy versus just kind of saying finance has been too extractive and we need more kind of industrial capacity because industry itself has become overly financialized. Many companies, you know, Pfizer and Cisco spend huge amounts of their income just on buying back their shares to boost stock prices, stock options, and executive pay. Yeah, that doesn't bother me. We might talk about that. I I think that's a bit of a red herring, but I I, want to make a – 
a quibble about Adam Smith, and then I want to move on to more substantive stuff. I, I don't. I, I'm pretty confident Adam Smith never used the phrase free market. Um, so when we talk about whether that means free from the state or free from rent, the part I agree with is surely Adam Smith was a big fan of competition and knew that without it, uh, business would often create cartels and and try to raise prices and exploit consumers. That's clearly uh, – he was very aware of the profit motive. Uh, but he also was very wary of overman involvement of government and the economy. So I, you know, I think he was both a fan of competition and a fan of limited intervention. He's not an anarchist. Neither am I. Most people I know who call themselves free market. They don't literally mean no government. Uh, but I think the interesting – Places where you and I disagree, and we're going to get to those soon, are, are over over that uh, – what's the appropriate uh, role for government? Uh, thinking about finance, my dislike of the financial sector or concern about the financial sector is its ability to use other people's money to invest and to create financial vehicles. And, and that, to me, is overwhelmingly driven by the opportunity to use – government money uh, from from bailouts and the prospect, prospect of bailouts. Do you, do you worry about that? Uh, in, it seems to me in your book, at least in one place, you, you were a fan of the bailouts. Do you think those were a mistake uh, and do they worry you or do they worry you? Marianne, are you there? Mm, we lost you. I'm going to call you back if you can't hear me. If you can't hear me, I'm going to call you back. Hello. Hey, I don't know what happened there. I lost you. Oh, that's weird. Can you hear me now? I can. Did you hear me ask that question? I heard you. I I, I heard you all fine. So I can ask. Did you hear me say? Yeah. So take a breath and go ahead. So I'm not either a fan or an an unfan of the bailouts. I'm, you know, in terms of the bailouts, what was interesting for me is that. You know, many people don't realize that governments saved the capitalist system from falling apart through the bailouts. Now, where I'm definitely not a fan is that, you know, you shouldn't just bail out a system. If you bail it out, which they did, and that, again, saved the capitalist system from basically um, exploding in terms of, you know, finance, global finance uh, was saved. uh, There should have been very strong conditions attached to then what had to happen, even just purely financial conditions, to be honest. I mean, you know, the the level of risk also that governments took in the bailout process should have been rewarded. So if the taxpayer is saving Goldman Sachs, what did the taxpayer get back uh, from Goldman Sachs in terms of that kind of risk reward relationship? And I find, to be honest, this is a general problem, you know, when government uh, – gave a guaranteed loan to Solyndra for $500 million. It gave almost the same amount to Tesla. Solyndra went bust. Taxpayer bailed out Solyndra and got pretty uh, peeved off in the process. But why did they not get a direct return from the Tesla investment? Because, of course, what we know, and any venture capitalist would admit this, that for every success that you have when you're investing in innovative uh, areas, you're going to have to uh, accept quite a high failure rate. And what was very interesting also, because this all happened right after the financial crisis, by the way, these investments that then were made in different types of green green tech areas. What Obama said to Tesla is the opposite of what he should have said. He said, if you don't pay back the loan, we get 3 million shares in your company. Um, And the price per share when Tesla received the, the, the loan in 2009 was $9 a share when it paid it back because it was successful. In 2013, it was 90 per share. Imagine that difference multiplied by 3 million that would have more than paid back the Solyndra loss and the next round of investment. That same mentality could have been also um, you know, played out with Goldman Sachs, not just getting back the money, but getting it back with a high level of interest given the risk that the taxpayer was uh, was um, you know taking on, and so this is the problem, and I think this probably gets to the heart of where you and I disagree. I don't see the role of government as just kind of enabling and facilitating investing in infrastructure, you know, roads, police force, private property. Historically, in capitalism, which is a system that has been fundamentally driven by innovation, the government, when organized, big when I'm Italian, so I know when this goes wrong, big when when organized properly. 
through these DARPA type institutions, but also, you know, around the world, we see these popping up in different forms, has actually been an investor of first resort, not just a lender of last resort, has allowed certain high risk, high capital intensive areas to be financed before the business sector is willing to put their money in. In fact, the history of venture capital is very clear. They've only come in after the government paid the wave. Um, uh, you know, for example, in biotech, 20 to 30 years of National Institutes of Health spending before the venture capitalists came in. So in terms of the bailouts, where I see they went wrong was not so much the bailout itself, but the complete lack of conditions attached to make sure that the public sector and the taxpayers in the process got back a reward for this big risk that they took in bailing out banks that could have just then ended up going under. So we disagree on that in that I don't think they saved capitalism. I think they'd already hampered it and done some bad things in the past with previous bailouts before 2008 that helped set the stage for it. But that's a different talk, I don't, a different conversation. I want to I want to move away from that because I think what you've said about the proper role for government and government's potential to be reimbursed or to share in the gains is the really interesting question. It's the I think the most innovative part of your work. And uh, so I'm going I'm to step back. So you argue that there's been a lot of uh, innovation in the last decades that was government funded, government started, and that venture capitalists uh, reaped the benefits of and, and taxpayers got little or nothing from other than indirect uh, taxing of the profitability of the corporations that and, and investors if that, that enjoyed if it. That. <laughs> but I'm, yeah. I'm going to go back early in that. This is certainly the transformation of the standard of living in the modern world over the last 300 years, government did not play a crucial innovative role in that. Or did it? In other words, in my view, which you said characterized quite accurately, I want government to set the rules, uh, allow for courts, property rights, police, defense, infrastructure that's poorly provided by the private sector, like sewage, mm -hmm. perhaps. Uh, but that it was government's role until uh, maybe 70 or 80 years ago. And the, la the first 200 years of the Industrial Revolution – did transform standard of living through innovation and technology without government taking an active role, or do you disagree with that? So I think there's two different issues. One is that the government has historically definitely played uh, a basic role. So funding the roads, including the railroads and, um, you know, schools and kind of what we call in economic speak or innovation speak, these horizontal conditions that without which, you know, it'd be very hard to have successful commerce and competition between companies that wanted to invest and innovate because you wouldn't basically have the groundwork there. And those aren't areas. Infrastructure is not an area where, where the private sector has been willing to invest in. Uh, where I differ is that, you know, basically how we talk about this in economics is that this is about fixing market failures. So fixing those areas where the private sector is not investing, whether they're, it's due to a positive externality. So areas where the spillovers from that investment are so large, it's hard to appropriate the profits from that. So the private sector doesn't invest. So public sector has to come in. That's, by the way, why I sound American, but I'm Italian. So my dad does basic research in nuclear fusion physics. So we left Italy to go to the U.S. because the U.S. Department of Energy has been a big investor in these kinds of uh, basic research, energy areas that the private sector you know, wasn't willing to invest in. Very little controversy there. Um, or negative externalities, pollution, you know, it's the opposite problem where companies aren't including in their cost structures the kind of negative things they're doing like polluting. So the government might have to come in with something like a carbon tax. So this notion of what the government's for, it's not that it's wrong. It's just very limited. It's just fixing a problem. And those problems definitely exist. There's big market failures. What my approach has been is to say, well, let's step back a minute. That explains some things, but it doesn't help explain innovation, kind of big, important, general purpose technologies. So, you know, revolutionary changes that have occurred around the internet, around aviation, around renewable energy, around nanotech, biotech, which actually required government to play a much larger role, which I call market shaping and market co-creating, not just market fixing. And this is not, I repeat, not about the state versus the private sector. The private sector, of course, is important in all those different areas that I just mentioned, 
very important private businesses were, you know, part of that value creation process. But the role of the public sector wasn't just, you know, creating the background infrastructure, skills and um, education or some rules of the game that leveled the playing field. It was also acting as an investor first resort. Everything in your smartphone, if you have a smartphone, which I assume you do because we're Skyping and you must have some smart products in front of you, (laughs) everything that makes those products smart and not stupid were government financed. Forget whether it was a civil servant or a public servant, you know, who actually thought about it. But the money, the high risk funds did not come from venture capital. It came from government. Well, so some of it the did. internet. No, some inter- of it. Wait, not wait, wait. all of it. Let me just list them it, in your smartphone. I assume you have a smartphone. I you do. do. <laughs> you don't have one of those little curly wired ones. Mm. Right. So internet, GPS, touchscreen display, Siri. They were all government finance. Other things, of course, were financed by business, but I'm not debating that. We know no, that. We have those things all over the world. But the, mm-hmm. Those things that were, quote, financed by government, touchscreen, GPS, Siri, mm-hmm. et cetera, they were partly funded by government. Things, innovations that made them possible in their final form were funded by government. But, of course, there were other innovations that made them useful and yeah, practical no that were not funded. That. But see, we're on – what I'm not doing is saying the private sector was not important. What what you are potentially doing, and, you know, maybe you are not, but some other people are, many people are, is denying the role that government played in doing more than just the infrastructure. Government around even, you know, battery storage today, which would be the equivalent. It's a huge innovation. It's it's actually downstream. It's not just basic research. The biggest innovation came out of ARPA-E, which is the sister organization of DARPA, which was in the Department of Defense, which basically came up with the internet. Now, the point is not, oh, there was also some private sector activity. We know that. The real question is, how could it be that a whole book on Steve Jobs, that great book by Isaacson, which also turned into a movie, that not one page, not one paragraph, not one sentence, not one little word, this is my point, not one word on any of the public investments that made Apple's success possible, which is not to say the people working in Apple are not incredibly smart geniuses and Apple as a company is not fantastic. I think that that's true. But, you know, for example, the great design and, you know, the fact that Steve Jobs also took those calligraphy classes, that's all really well documented there. And that itself is incredibly important. I would never dismiss that. But why do we dismiss the role of government? And also the self-fulfilling prophecy, by the way, is when you do dismiss, one dismisses the role of government, we also don't ask the difficult questions. Well, what does this mean? How should we actually set up different types of public organizations so they welcome risk-taking, welcome exploration, experimentation, and can be innovative, as innovative as DARPA was, but in the areas like health or energy or whatever. These key questions that business schools ask of private business because they know correctly so, that business is innovative and value creating. They take classes like strategic management, organizational behavior, decision sciences. There's none of that training for public servants. So we end up getting the kind of inertial, slow, bureaucratic public servants, and then we call them bureaucratic, slow, and inertial. Well, that's how we made them because we didn't admit actually the success stories of when government was organized differently. So I would never deny any of that. I think that's all true. I think the real question, which is the big question you you pose, and I think it's a great question, is uh, what do we make of this? What are the implications of this reality? So we do romanticize often, and I'm guilty of this, the private sector's innovative use of, of these underlying technologies. And I maybe don't sufficiently remember or champion the role that government innovation played in allowing them to flourish. But I think there's a a flip side of that is we don't want to over romanticize what government achieved. In particular, in particular, almost all of these innovations came out of the Defense Department, the military, the space program, things that were the United States is really good at. I mean, you know, my I'm going to give you a different perspective on government from the standard one or yours, which is, you know, government's really good at two things, killing people and taking money from one group and giving it to to another. And the killing part is the United States has got a really good military. That's one of its most successful things. It's led to a bunch of good things at times and some really horrible things at other times. It's not the scope of this conversation. But a sidelight of that, the ridiculous amount of money that we've devoted to the military in the United States is that, yeah, we've come up with a bunch of technologies that were used in ways that were never intended, never planned by the government as some private Innovations are also uh, 
come out that way. So the question then is, would what do we make of that? Obviously, you're not going to suggest we should increase the size of the military budget in the United States because it has all these positive spillovers, I assume. What do, we, what do we do with the fact that, yes, some government innovation, particularly from the military, has been useful to private sector actors? Right. Well, so one of the points of my book is really – sorry, the, the other book, the Entrepreneurial State book, <laughs> was to first document what the – link to. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, which uh, was basically to document exactly what you just said, which is the role that the military threw, by the way, at different types of organizations. It wasn't just kind of top down, you know, Department of the Military. It was through yeah. the kind of more nimble DARPA type institutions had on innovation. But then the next question was, so what are the lessons being learned or not being learned? Unfortunately, lots of lessons are not learned about how we might devise similar types of organizations in other areas, which actually are urgent and they also have security um, implications. Now, I should first start by saying they have been learned in some areas. So in health, you know, the National Institutes of Health in the U.S., publicly funded body, spend over $30 billion a year on financing some of the most high risk, high capital intensive parts of the innovation cycle in both biotech and pharmaceuticals. And uh, in fact, the health department basically is second to the Department of Defense, Department of Energy as well, as I mentioned before, fusion, but not just fusion, lots of applied areas, for example, through ARPA-E that I mentioned, which is the sister organization of DARPA. So in some ways, one could say we have, you know, it's, it used to be just the military industrial complex. In fact, all those different um, technologies I mentioned, internet, GPS, you know, those were kind of the Navy basically discovered GBS, uh, GPS. Um, you know, those lessons have been somewhat carried over to these other areas. But the point that I've actually been working on a lot with global governments, and ironically, Trump is unlearning the Silicon Valley story at the same time that China is learning it. <laughs> that should be a big worry for Americans interested in competitiveness. Um, what's interesting is how do we then take really important challenges that we have, whether it's around climate change, the future of health systems, growing inequality in some countries. So just take what we call the sustainable development goals, these 17 goals that over 100 countries have signed up to. How do you turn them into not just these kind of blah, blah challenges, but really concrete moonshots that could actually also have some sort of innovation road mapping, both through international organizations together, because many of these challenges are global, but also within countries, even at the city level, you know, or at the state level, if, if you see what... Um, California is at least uh, talking about doing around climate change, what would it look like, question mark, to have kind of a mission-oriented approach towards the way that public and private sector actors co-invest across the whole innovation chain to tackle particular challenges? And by the way, I, I just wrote a report. It's, it's probably the thing I'm most proud of which came out last February, uh, February 2018, for the European Commission. You know, I'm Italian and live in the UK, but grew up in the US. So I'm a bit of a chameleon here, but I wrote it for the commission to say, hey guys, you spend all this money on innovation, but look at what happened in the US when they did the moonshot. To go to the moon and back again in one generation required not only, you know, really ambitious agency like NASA coming up with that ambition, very inspirational, bold, and high risk, but also required lots of different sectors in the industrial base to work on that problem. So it wasn't just aeronautics. It was also clothing. You couldn't go to the moon in jeans and a t-shirt. Nutrition. You couldn't just eat a hamburger or a hot dog up there, right? So lots of different sectors had to innovate and invest to get there. That should you know, be important today when we see the record level hoarding that we have in both Europe and um, the US, but also lots of different projects and kind of homework problems had to be resolved hundreds of which many failed and the ones that succeeded are precisely those in our smart products today. So it's not about public or private, but how do you also set a really strategic direction for this public investment? So instead of the NIH just plowing in 32 billion a year and kind of just assuming that somehow this is going to end up resolving great health problems and then allowing, I mean, this is what's crazy, allowing the pharmaceutical industry to set whatever price they want through this dysfunctional notion of value that they call value-based pricing, why not learn from that mission-oriented approach to the moon and kind of implement that for how we think of the big challenges around health and energy? So I think NASA is a quite interesting case. Um, there was a very specific goal, get to the moon and back. We 
mobilized through the public sector and the private sector, as you point out, an enormous amount of resources. Uh, I happen to be a very romantic uh, lover of, of space travel. So mm-hmm. I'm really glad we went personally, but I'm not sure it was worth it. Um, and I think that's right. the challenge. You know, it's hard to pick the goal. Should the goal be yeah. to mobilize everything to cure cancer? If so, which kind? Should the goal be to cure uh, various other health challenges? Should we try to get better water to Africa, cleaner water in Africa? I mean, there's so many human challenges. And the yeah. question is, should, w- will, will the government do a good job? I, I think NIH is a great example. I'm a big fan of NIH. I think there's a very powerful case for uh, private uh, for, excuse me, for government funding of basic research, but there's also a good case for private funding through foundations, and they're doing that yeah. in courses as well. There's fads in medicine that NIH responds to. There are fads in political roles that influence what political forces that influence what NIH, what NIH spends its money on, which I'm not sure a good thing. But I, I think the deeper point, and I want to come back to your point about Solyndra and Tesla, which I think is the more interesting point of, of, of practical public policy. You make the point, which I think is undeniable, that government spending uh, often leads to benefits that are, go uncaptured, say, by taxpayers and then get captured by, say, venture capitalists or uh, the pharmaceutical industry in the case of NIH. I want to hear the case for why I should care about that. What should – it's undeniably true. It just doesn't seem to me to be necessarily – that to me does not – it's undeniably true that government spending – has side benefits for private actors and for taxpayers and 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 that there's value created by some government activity, maybe a lot. Why does that imply that government that should be a profit center and a receiver yep. of revenue uh, when those go well? Okay. So I think, first of all, you framed it really well. It's a really important question, and I'll sort of unpick different dimensions of it. First of all, the public did care. The U.S. population apparently cared a lot when Solyndra went bust. There was a whole discussion, almost every paper I I saw at least addressed it, which was what is government doing? Government should not be picking winners. It should just be doing those background kind of uh, investments that we were talking about in the beginning, kind of set the rules of the game, protect private property, invest in roads and infrastructure, and then get out of the way. So the first point is to say, Actually, government has historically done much more than that, and sometimes it succeeded, and sometimes it has failed. The Solyndra loss, which everyone seemed to know about, was a failure. Why did they not know about the Tesla success? Most people would not know that Tesla's initial investment came from Uncle Sam, nor would they know that Elon Musk, the person behind Tesla and forget his more recent reputation after he started tweeting. (laughs) Twitter seems to be the downfall of many people. Maybe I should stop tweeting. Um, uh, uh, You know, Elon Musk himself has received $5 billion of different forms for his three companies, uh, SpaceX, SolarCity, and Tesla. So the first point is just the marketing. Government has actually been quite stupid. It hasn't marketed, you know, the successes. It's just allowed people to know about the failures because it's very easy to criticize things when they go wrong. Um, The second point is it's not true that government just funds basic R&D because I would agree with you, to be honest. When government is funding basic R&D, forget it. Don't worry about getting a monetary return. You do it precisely because it's a public good. Those spillovers do spill over in terms of the great knowledge that is you know, created that the private sector was not willing to fund for the reasons I laid out before, and that itself is a return to the country. You've created this great thing called the knowledge base. But the truth is government has gone way beyond that in recent years, precisely because finance has become inc- um, increasingly short-termist. Much of the long-term patient finance downstream, and by downstream I mean to the actual companies like the Tesla investment, which is a $465 million guaranteed loan to one company that's very different from you know, funding uh, a nuclear fusion that I was mentioning before my father moved from Italy to the U.S. for. Um, that, I think, is naive. It's simply naive for government not to at least ask what should the return be beyond some sort of you know, basic spillovers because there isn't a basic spillovers. That's for the Tesla car, which, by the way, is quite expensive, so it's not as if it reaches every American. For those kinds of downstream investments, unlike the basic R&D, There's all sorts of different ways that government could get a return. One could be equity. I'm not necessarily a big fan of that. It was just interesting that the government did think about it, 
but in the opposite way it should have. It said, if you don't pay back the loan, we get 3 million shares. I'm saying it should have said the opposite. But there's other ways that it could think about the return. I just wrote a report called The People's Prescription, Rethinking Health Innovation for Public Value for the Pharmaceutical Industry. And there the public return could also be conditions on reinvestment. You know, lots of these big pharmaceutical companies, but also the big energy companies don't reinvest their profits. They increasingly hoard them or use them for share buybacks, which would be fine if these were atomistic, you know, companies just getting their profits out of the blue. But if it also is due to public investment, there could be that condition, which by the way, is the condition that got us Bell Labs. AT&T was forced to to reinvest its profits in order to retain its monopoly status. That's where Bell Labs came from. It could be conditions on the IPR, so the patent system. Today we are we have a dysfunctional patent system. I have nothing against patents, but we have allowed patents to be uh, so intellectual property rights to go increasingly upstream so that the tools for research are being patented. That's a bad deal for the state which has given a 20-year monopoly on uh, to a company what Ideally, what happened after those 20 years is that knowledge then gets diffused more than it used to be in the Middle Ages when there was just secrecy. Nothing was written down. The patents actually you know, codify this knowledge. But if we've patented the science, then it's, it becomes very hard for that to happen. Or it could also be conditions on pricing. And that's the obvious thing that we should have done with the medicines, which receive something like two-thirds of the research funding from the state, why don't the medicine prices reflect that? So those are just examples, you know, equity, reinvestment, IPR, or prices could be the way that government gets less naive for its public investment. So we don't just socialize risks, but also socialize rewards, not in a communist way, but to make capitalism more functional. So I agree with you on the patents. Uh, We have a dysfunctional system, and I recommend listeners go to the Robin Feldman episode. We'll put a link up to that where he talked about some of the ways that the system is uh, currently being abused uh, by the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so I, I agree with you on that. I, I, w- I want to talk, but I want to talk about this general issue of patience and short-termism. Mm. Uh, government's pretty short-term too. Most politicians have a very short time horizon. I don't see any reason to think they're going to be more long-term on, than, than private sector investors. And in fact, we see right now, we've seen it many times, private sector uh, R and D, enormous amounts of money going into areas that are very iffy, and that take a very large amount of patience. Uh, the genetic mapping of the genome, of course, much of it came from the public sector, but a lot of it's coming from the private sector. People are waiting for that return in biotech. It's not really come along, but people continue to invest in it, and I'm optimistic it'll happen. But of course, along the way, a lot of people will have lost a lot of money because it took t- too long for their uh, their horizon. Similarly, the driverless car, uh, extraordinary amounts of money being put into it by enormous companies spending huge amounts of money for a long, long period of time. So I, I don't see patience uh, as the as the biggest problem with why we don't have more innovation. I, I'm I see the fundamental problem being that it's just really hard to do, and I don't see why. I agree with you. The government has spent some time and money doing things beyond the rules. It's occasionally successful uh, to be uh, crude about it. I would say a a pig every once in a while finds a truffle so that the military sector, for example, does come up with lots of things that it didn't intend that it have nice human impact beyond um, war. But what's the Mm -hmm. evidence that government's going to do this well? Why would we encourage government to step outside its rulemaking, rule keeping area and, and, and do things like Tesla and Solyndra. Tesla, I, I'm against it. I wish they hadn't given that loan guarantee. It might have <laughs> happened by the private sector mm-hmm. anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, it may, but it did turn out pretty well so far. Uh, we'll see. Uh, you know, people debate about whether Tesla is really a, a viable concern in the absence of government help of other kinds. But so, I mean, the government does lots of things really badly in the United States. Uh, school system, one of its fundamental roles, which should be sp- spending a lot more time and and potentially money if it could spend it well doesn't do well. Uh, so I think that's the fundamental reason that fundamental reason that so many Americans are skeptical about a more active role for government innovation. Forget the Department of Motor Vehicles, which is a standard or the post office which are things that you know people small government people like to pick on. I'll pick on the big stuff, education, the thing government should be doing and should be doing well doesn't do well. Why mm. should I why should we have a, a more active role? Why should government compete 
with private sector investors for innovation. Why should it be involved? Let's let's let the private sector, which is very imperfect at it, it's hard to do. These are people who have a lot of money at stake and they still make lots of mistakes. Why would we think government officials would do better? Okay. So first of all, I went to a state school in New Jersey, Princeton High School, and it was a great state school. There's other state schools that are terrible. There's some private companies that work really well, very efficient, produce great products and services that the world wants to buy, other ones that don't. So my point is there's nothing, as I mentioned before, in the DNA of the public sector or the private sector that will necessarily make it a good innovator because we have admitted that the private sector is essential, as it is, to innovation, we ask really difficult questions to it. And that's why the top you know, CEOs also go to some great business schools to study those issues. Uh, one of my colleagues wrote a book called Rejuvenating the Mature Corporation. Why? Because when corporations get big and heavy and bureaucratic, they can get really inertial and slow and dinosaurish. So they have to rethink themselves. When the government becomes big and bureaucratic, we just say, oh, that's government. Government's bureaucratic, right? So the first thing is to recognize that value is, in fact, potentially created collectively by different types of actors, including, by the way, this isn't just about public and private. The third sector has become, so the voluntary kind of philanthropic sector has become increasingly important in some areas, like say the Gates Foundation around health. But also we should never forget trade unions. (laughs) We would not have weekends. We would not have the eight hour workday. We would not have, you know, children not working in the factories without trade unions fighting for that, which was a fundamental force in capitalism to make it work as it currently does. It was a part of this market co-creation process that I mentioned in the beginning. So if we then hone in on the public sector, we should ask difficult questions to it. How should you organize yourself? Because if you're not organized properly, you won't be able to uh, organize your activities, whether it's education, health, or energy, or particular investments in those areas well. So the real question should be what has happened in recent years to the way the U.S. has thought about education, including, by the way, the outsourcing of the capacity of the government to even be innovative. I mean, I've seen this from NASA to other organizations around the world. They've increasingly disinvested in their own ability to think big and to have internal capabilities, which we all know is important in the private sector. But the other really important issue you raise is this short-termism because the the business sector is short-termist due to certain factors, for example, the pressure from shareholders, but the governments are often short-termist for the reasons of elections. (laughs) You know, if an election happens every four years or five years or whatever, that might make the politician at best just have a little pet project just so they have their name on it or, you know, at worst, just not want to make any important investment and just kind of hand out some money to potential voters. And that's all sorts of, you know, all sorts of issues around corruption and capture can occur there. And that's true. So my question is, and this is why I've set up this Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at University College London, is to actually pose those questions. So, for example, well, how was DARPA set up? Or because everyone knows about DARPA, let me mention a different organization. How was the Italian EDI set up? How do you spell <laughs> this that? Was I-R-I. It was called the East. Oh God, what was it called actually? I think it was the Istituzione della Ricostruzione Italiana. So this was basically the public entity that was set up, um, God, under Mussolini, sorry, I, I hate to talk about its original uh, foundations, but it became one of the most innovative um, organizations in Italy when it was transitioning from an agricultural uh, economy to an industrial economy. And it had three phases, public and not politicized, public and super politicized, so each party put its hands in, and then privatized. And the second and third stages were equally bad in terms of its ability to actually be ambitious and innovative. The first phase, it actually constructed what's called the Autostrada del Sole, the motorway that goes from the top of the boot (laughs) to the bottom of the boot uh, towards Sicily in four years. And it was a huge amount of kilometers, um, whereas recently... It could barely do the Turin to Milan. So how it was actually constructed in that early phase, which was um, um, uh, independent from all the different political parties getting their hands in, actually made it one of the coolest places to work. The top Italian managers found it to be an honor to work inside Edie. In more recent um, history, I found that it was very interesting when Obama 
was doing his fiscal fiscal stimulus package, which in Europe we kind of forgot to do because we just obsessed about austerity. He had about an 800 billion that he wanted to pour into the system. And initially he, I think, had some really interesting ambitions around it. He really wanted to green the economy. And so he, this was the, the period, precisely the period that ARPA-E ended up getting set up in 2009, one year after the crisis. And because he had an ambition to direct the fiscal stimulus and he really started talking about the green kind of manufacturing, you know, how to use green as a direction for the whole economy. It was an honor for a Nobel Prize winning physicist called Steve Chu, a Chinese American, to direct that agency. The Department of Energy for a certain period was directed by a Nobel Prize winning physicist who then set up ARPA-E, but he would have never even wanted to do it. Forget what actually happened, what didn't. Just talk about talent. You know, how do you attract talent? No Nobel Prize winning physicist would have wanted to work for an agency whose remit was, oh, go help Elon Musk, you know, go de-risk Elon Musk, go fix a market failure. It really had a mission as, as ambitious as the DOD has had to win the war or, you know, go up to space. And that becomes one of the ways that you also track talent. Then how you use your tools, for example, procurement policy, prize schemes, grants to really crowd in that bottom-up experimentation because we know top-down doesn't work. That's why the Soviet system failed. But how do you use uh, government instruments? Let's just take procurement policy, which is government's purchasing power to uh, kind of be very clear on what government wants. For example, we want we want uh, soldiers not to die when they're in the, inside their tanks. Well, driverless cars are not a bad solution to that. And that's basically where the initial investments in driverless cars came from. Fracking, by the way, also came mainly from the DOE, which doesn't mean that the private sector later wasn't important. Of course it was. But what you often see from these mission-oriented public agencies is they laid the way, they took on the initial risk. They also had a bold kind of inspiration to solve a public need, which could be either fighting the war or curing a disease or getting a renewable s source of energy, which then, if done in ambitious ways, lays the groundwork for then the private sector to increase their expectations of where these future growth possibilities lie. The irony is that when government doesn't have that ambition, it ends up actually doing what we end up blaming government for, either being too boring and slow or even worse, crowding out. This, this word that economists like crowding out the private sector because they end up doing what the private sector should do but doesn't do. Well, I think the crowding out is important to think about uh, how important it is. It's always an empirical question. But, you know, one yeah. of the challenges we haven't talked about is that I meant to mention this when we talked about the space achievements of NASA and the getting to the moon. We don't know what the opportunity cost is of that. We don't know what was foregone. We don't know what investments – or activities didn't take place, we look at the success and we get happy about it. And that's true. Uh, you know, the same would be true of Bell Labs, other things that, that led to good outcomes or ones that we point to that we happen to like. I want to go back to one thing you said there just because I think it's it's important. I don't think trade unions have much to do with the fact that children don't work in the, in the, in the mines or anywhere else anymore, that there's a weekend or that there's a um, shorter work week. We have a shorter work week for the last, the week, the amount of time people work has been falling steadily because we want to work less. We're richer. It's a market force, and that trade unions occasionally have have uh, asked for. But if it wasn't happening through market forces, if it wasn't what people wanted, it would have been very hard to get. Uh, and often they don't, they're increasingly less important now for that reason. I, so I that's, think that's historically just wrong. I mean, trade unionists and workers. I mean, just talk about workers. Trade unions are simply their organization that kind of bargains for them. But workers fought for many and died for many of these advantages that you just mentioned. It's I just, think they would have happened anyway. I don't well, think there's. Okay. I don't think we'd well, yeah, be working. That's, that's, I don't think we'd be no working seven I days a week. That. I mean, I could say the uh, private sector would have invented the internet. I mean, but you have no way to actually prove that. So let's well, just I, talk well, about the point you're making. I think it's an important point. There's some no, evidence for it. It's not just an empty claim. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. fact that the work week is getting shorter now without oh, unions. Different. Yeah, yeah, is I would an agree example with that part. That yeah. But, but the eight-hour workday is something that was specifically fought for by trade unions. Uh, you know, the fact that construction workers have construction hats, 
when they get that job was fought for by trade unionists. Otherwise, things were falling on their heads and people actually had to pay for their own construction hats. There's many different examples I could give you like that that was fought for. That doesn't mean that we glorify trade unions. I personally think that they should be much more offensive and less defensive with uh, technology. They should, if we had a stakeholder governance type of corporate governance, trade unions would be at the table, you know, saying – whatever, I mean, whether it's good or bad, what they're saying is not even the point, but they would be debating alongside the shareholders, alongside the managers, alongside some businesses, sorry, government officials that would be at the table, given the subsidies that these businesses are receiving, what form of, you know, sort of new digital landscape are we, you know, co-creating together and, and, and why we should really kind of think through how to uh, uh, allow um, or how, how to construct the type of, you know, kind of big data, AI kind of a, uh, uh, market that is currently developing instead of always ex post worry about the effects it might be having on labor or taxation. But your, your other question I think is a really important one, which is, you know, was the moonshot even something to do? Would it have happened anyway? So one of the issues is, is if you take a systems perspective, which, which I do take, cause I really believe in innovation systems. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, the Soviet Union was spending a huge amount on innovation, one of the biggest funders of it in the world, but or science, sorry, I should say science and the whole knowledge base, but it didn't turn into innovation in terms of commercializable innovation because they didn't have innovation systems. They didn't have those, for example, science industry linkages. They didn't have a financial system that was flexible. So systems do matter. So even though you put in a lot of R&D money, that won't lead to innovation unless you have that system. So once you take that, I mean, that's just one example, but once you really unpick that in terms of the real kind of granular structures that were important in places like Silicon Valley, then you could ask, even if we hadn't gotten to the moon, and back again, but you had actually structured the innovation system properly. So you had both public and private actors across that innovation chain working in this dynamic way as they in fact did in that case. Would all these spillovers, which ended up happening along the way, happened anyway? And I think the answer there is sort of yes, which is that what really matters is the process, the system. So if you have a linear top-down system where you think that just because you put in a lot of money that somehow is going to you know, lead to great things at the end, that almost never works. If you get kind of the feedback loops happening, this is something, by the way, that the U.S. has started to underfund. You know, Germany has these Fraunhofer Institutes. Um, the, the U.K. is investing in these catapult centers. This is really one of the great things that the U.S. did have, which was, you know, centers where industry and big science, kind of basic blue sky science met in places like Stanford and places um, that the, uh, the uh, great national labs. Um, if we stop not only funding them, but stop also making sure that they're structured in ambitious ways that are not also measured in really static ways that they have to prove their economic value tomorrow, um, then, you know, they will remain very important parts of that system. But, you know, in some ways, I think that the way we elect politicians should be based on the moonshots. You know, look at Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez's campaign around the Green New Deal. Forget whether she's right or wrong, but that's how she campaigned. We shouldn't be using, you know, net present value and cost benefit calculations on whether we should be going to the moon. That should be what politicians you know, kind of argue for in order to get elected. You know, we want a green transition. We want a digital revolution. We think we should be tackling the big productivity challenges. That's how we should be in a democratic society, electing our politicians. Then once they're elected, we should make sure that we have the right kind of public institutions, private institutions, third sector institutions, interesting places for them to collaborate and dialogue together on how to then achieve those goals. But unfortunately, I would argue that the political process has also become incredibly static and uh, miserable, where we're not also debating some of the biggest challenges of our times and people are getting elected based on a pretty flimsy promises. Well, I'll probably agree on that. Uh, I want to go back to something you said about uh, risk taking, because it's another part of our, I think, an area that I think is easily missed. You talked, you said in passing, and it's it's all over your book as well about how the public sector, quote, takes the risk. Uh, they took the risk with Tesla. That one panned out. They took the risk with Cylinder. It didn't pan out. Uh, they, in the NIH, all the fundamental research that's, that's taking place there, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. 
But the problem is, and this is, I would say, the uh, crucial difference between the public and private sector and a challenge, I think, to your vision of, of a larger public role, is that the public sector doesn't really have to take risk because it can always raise money at the point of a gun through the tax system, whereas mm-hmm. the private sector runs out of money. If the idea doesn't work, there's eventually they can't attract investment anymore and it disappears. Do you worry about that as a problem with the public sector that I, I know we don't want to overstate the role of profits, but since there's often no accounting measure of success or failure for, for investments of these kinds that we're talking about, how will we know that they're done well and what's to stop bad ideas from continuing to take money away from good ideas? Um, so I would even be more extreme than you are. In some ways, I'd, I'd be agreeing with you, but even more than than you just said, which is that the government actually doesn't rely on taxes. It can even just literally print the money. That's what it does when we go to war. I don't think you've ever heard a government say, oh, sorry, we can't go to Afghanistan. We don't have enough tax money. We can't go to Iraq. We can't fight World War II. In those cases, and this comes back to your previous point about the military industrial complex, when things were or seen or framed in terms of security issues, urgency, national priorities, they can, unlike a family, unlike unlike a household, just create that money and hence also potentially run into this, well, actually run into this accountability question. So, but but that's a first very important point, which sometimes would work against um, some of what maybe some of your listeners think, which is that the government should be acting like a responsible household uh, because you shouldn't be spending the money you don't have. So the first point is governments are not households. They actually can, A, print the money, and B, uh, well, this is when you have your own central bank, by the way, um, in Europe, that's different, uh, and, and also you can stimulate the economy, and if done so properly, you can actually generate a lot of tax revenue if you also want to fund your your priorities through tax revenue. So that's just the first kind of clarification. But that's true. But, hold on. But, no, no, but then your point comes in, which is the important point, which is then there's a big distinction, right? You know, if a private sector company doesn't do things well, it'll just fail. By the way, that's not always true. Just look at all of Trump's businesses. <laughs> he just got up again because he got bailed out. So that's your bailout question before. But anyway, so so that's a really important question, which is what is the right way to then account for, measure, yeah. evaluate government activity, given that, you know, it's different from a private sector company, which in theory, not in practice, but in theory would just go under if it underperforms. So the first issue is um, kind of more uh, a proactive kind of point, which is the kind of point I was making before. Well, let's learn from those parts of government that worked well, precisely on that issue. One of DARPA's great success points is precisely knew when to turn the tap off. This wasn't just turning the tap on, throwing a lot of public money in. The reason the DARPA, the ARPA E's, and the global, you know, the few global organizations that have been able to replicate that kind of um, organization in the public sector have been successful is they not only had the missions that we were talking about before, but also were flexible, you know, taking risks, but also flexible inside to know when should we turn this tap off because it just isn't going anywhere. And that requires going against the grain because if someone is in there just for career reasons or just wanting to, you know, please uh, the supervisor, you might just keep the tap on. So also you, um, you know, show that that organization, you know, funded all these great things. But if it's not, you know, happening, turn it off. And knowing how to turn off the tap is a skill. It means also having dynamic metrics because you don't want to turn it off too quickly because that might lead to short-termism. But if it's not going anywhere, stop funding it. Um, But the other issue is we should have dynamic metrics. So, I mean, let me give you a really concrete example. The Concorde plane, it's not flying. Is that a failure? It's definitely a private sector failure because the private sector would want to build the plane that is flying and they're earning profits from it. That would be stupid if it's not flying. For the public sector, which was a public, I mean, that was a publicly funded project, the actual investments made in the Concorde had massive spillovers across the economy and all sorts of other sectors. It actually led to innovation in different sectors. Now, the last thing I want to do is say that the Concorde plane was a good investment or the right investment or, or, or a success. But the metrics we have that governments should have should be dynamic metrics, which in this case should be able to capture explicitly the spillovers that occur across the economy 
with that investment, even if that investment, the final outcome fails. That kind of comes back to my point about the moonshot. Even if we hadn't gotten to the moon, had there been a functional, dynamic, innovative ecosystem, innovation system, then maybe it would have been less important getting to the moon as long as all those spillovers happen, which again are inside our smartphones today. Now, all I want to say with this is it's hard. None of this means, oh, it's easy, just throw a lot of public money at stuff. In fact, in Italy, the country I'm from, What's interesting is these lessons haven't been learned. So there's a lot of public money going to all sorts of things, but there aren't the right public structures. And by the way, one of the obsessions that economists have with the deficit, you know, oh, let's keep the deficit low, actually makes little sense when you look at different countries. Italy has always had a low deficit. It's almost always been lower than Germany's, for example, but its debt to GDP is very high. So debt to GDP is not the same thing as the deficit. And precisely because it's public and private actors, both of them, in the last 20 years have been pretty rubbish <laughs> at structuring themselves in strategic ways, providing that patient long-term finance in both areas, also the private sector, then their productivity hasn't grown. So long-run GDP hasn't grown, but that's the denominator of debt to GDP. So even with a mildly rising deficit, debt to GDP can in theory go to infinity if the denominator is not growing. Now, again, that doesn't mean just spend, 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 but what my point is spend wisely, strategically, and structure the organizations in both the public and the private sector in ways that are smart, mission-oriented, and also work together well, because almost all the challenges we have ahead have to happen in partnership. Now, we agree on the spend wisely part. I think the challenge, we probably agree on this too, the problem, the challenge is incentives. And my concern is that I don't see why the public sector bureaucrats, whether they're nimble or brilliant like Stephen Chu has a high IQ. I don't know if he's very useful as a bureaucrat or leader of an organization like that. It's a very expensive uh, assignment of his talents to that. And and it'd be interesting to see a cost-benefit study of that. But I just don't see why you would think that that's going to go well. Uh, in, In the private sector, Sure, but there's... it won't necessarily go well. Why should it always go well? You're putting a huge amount of pressure on a public organization that you, I don't think, would ever ask a private organization. A hundred percent probability that everything goes well. You never have innovation in the private sector if that's how they thought. Well, that's not what I think of go well. Go well to me means use the money, spend wisely. I don't know why. Of course, there's going to be failures. There's an enormous amount of uncertainty. Going back to the venture capital example. One out of ten is a ho- an incredible home run. Th- two out of th- two or three make a little bit of money, and the other four to five lose money, and it's all gone. You lose all of it. Mm-hmm. So it's very focusing. You're really trying hard to to do well, and even in that world, mm-hmm. it's really hard to do well. So I'd expect the public sector to do badly also. But at least in the private sector, they have to pass some kind of market test. I don't. But I you see have it. history, Russ. You have history against you. Fracking. Nuclear technology, aviation, internet, you know, green technology, without the public sector playing this ambitious mission-oriented role, you would not have had private innovation. So it's not about saying private good, public bad, or vice versa. It's about that the public sector, when it was ambitious, it actually laid the groundwork for the private sector to even see an opportunity for investment. Now, that's not necessarily true with gadgets. I am, I must say, this is where I would, you know, sort of put a a condition on what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the big stuff, (laughs) the big stuff that has driven growth under capitalism for the last 200 years. But that's, you know, history is complicated. My view of history, I give you my story and then you can counter and let you close it out. My story is that when government was small, which was up until about 1930, and government wasn't really even large until about 1960, and even then it wasn't it was mainly transfers, not actual regulation, innovation, and spending of the investments so that you were talking about, uh, private sector pretty well coming up with new stuff, really kind of amazing, like antibiotics. Uh, that's private. That's not public. Sure, many current antibiotics came were helped by public investment. But most of the innovations, uh, as I like, my, one of my favorite lines is uh, Orville Wright didn't have a pilot's license. A lot of the, the great innovations that uh, people came from were just private people fiddling around, sometimes for large amounts of money and other times just because they were creative people. Uh, Isaac Newton didn't come up with calculus because he thought it was going to make him rich. He did it because he loved thinking and respect of his peers. And that's a pretty powerful thing. And it's worked. it worked for, for a long time really well. And it would have continued to work really well, I think in the last half of the 20th century and the 21st, but you're right. Government 
through a bunch of things it didn't intend created some good stuff. You're hoping, I think, to some maybe this is unfair. I'd love for your, your reaction. You're hoping that if we tried harder to intend it, it would turn out even better. That just isn't obvious to me. But tell me why I'm wrong and uh, give you the last yeah. word. Okay. So again, uh, you know, for me, it's it's never about saying, oh, the private sector wasn't uh, uh, innovative during these periods in which I have tried to highlight and basically the history of some of these massive uh, technological shifts where the public sector did play a big role. It's not to say that the pub that the private sector was not important. It's that the form that these public investments, this is another thing I'd say, let's not use the word spend, but investments, public investments, investor first resort, played actually required not just a bunch of public money thrown at things, but particular types of organizations. And sometimes these fail just because of the, you know, it's inevitable to fail for, you know, all the successes that also occur, but also they could fail precisely because those organizations are um, structured problematically. So in inertial ways with the wrong kind of career structures where you're not allowed to take risk. I remember when I interviewed uh, Cheryl Martin, who was one of the first directors of ARPA-E, she said, we actually measure our success by how much risk we're willing to take and how much uh, then economy-wide success our successes have. So, so my first point is always about the structure, the structure, the structure, that because we've admitted the private sector is important, we structure it. In, in some cases, <laughs> properly, the public sector, unfortunately, is often misstructured. So I'm sort of agreeing with you when it doesn't work. Now, the... The times it's worked best was when it actually had a problem to solve. That's precisely why the military has actually been really important. They want to win the war. They want the soldiers not to die. They, you know, even a lot of the um, medical innovations have actually also been funded not just by the Department of Health but also by the Department of Defense because there are certain diseases or vulnerabilities that soldiers have, which you know people just living in wealthy cities don't have. So. You know, the question is these urgencies that then allowed government to take the problem seriously and to structure their innovation system in ways that was dynamic, that was fueled by both basic research and applied research and institutional capacity that fueled the feedback between them. Unfortunately, we haven't always learned those lessons in the big challenges we have ahead around health and energy. And I would actually argue in health, we sort of have because of the NIH, but actually the NIH, one of my critiques of it is it hasn't been ambitious enough. So most of the research spending that occurs in the National Institutes of Health, which is precisely the spending that has actually led to most of the new molecular entities with priority rating, again, it's been incredibly innovative also compared to the private pharmaceutical industry. However, why just drugs? Why have they allowed the pharmaceutical industry to define the market and not really also invest just as much in areas like healthy living? There's very little proper research on that. So many of us think we know what healthy living is, but it's kind of just voodoo. Um, <laughs> or you know, even to be honest, something more boring than healthy living, diagnostics and surgical treatments, much less research thrown at those areas than at drugs. So I think the role of a public actor, and I would also argue of a philanthropy, is to be a thorn in the side of how we define markets, to be an active market creator, not just in terms of investing where the private sector doesn't invest, but also redefining that market. Uh, that's, by the way, what I often argue the BBC was able to do in the broadcasting area, but that would be a whole other conversation, which we can maybe come to some other time. My guest today has been Mariana Mazzucato. Mariana, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Thank you very much. I'm glad we agreed and disagreed. <laughs> This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>